Hi everybody, I hope you're doing marvellously well. We're big, we're bad, and we're back with another episode of, believe it or not, Frequently Asked Questions Friday. Yes, Fact Friday is back again. Well, I hope you're doing marvellously well. Um, we have some good questions here. Eric has scoured our comment section and come up with these lovely questions. This first one's interesting. It says, what's the difference between a producer of today's world and one of the last century? That's a nice broad question because, of course, the role of the producer in the last century was massively varied. In the sort of uh, 40s age, it was probably... If there was such a thing, it was literally the person that hired the musicians and booked the hall and found probably the string arranger and even the composition. And it did start off as being a very administrative job. Even into the 50s and quite often in the 60s, it was mainly about hiring the right people for the right job and putting them in that situation. But during the 60s in particular, not to say it didn't happen in the 50s, but particularly in the 60s, producers started to get incredibly creative and be involved in the creative process. And of course, George Martin is probably most famous for really taking the production role to the next level, along with, of course, Phil Spector. Those two, and many others, but we'll just talk about those two for a second, those two became instrumental in the sound of the records. George Martin was able to facilitate ideas that the Beatles had. If they had a crazy idea, he would make it happen. He'd figure out a way. Phil Spector had incredibly nuts visions on production. For instance, uh, when my friend Jack Douglas worked with Phil Spector, he said to get that big acoustic guitar sound, he got about four or five people, sat them in a circle, all playing acoustic guitar, and put one mic in the middle. So that became like this wall of acoustic guitars. There was many, many different things that producers did. But in those days, of course, with the limitations of four, eight, possibly 16, and the most by the 70s and 80s on, 24 tracks, you really had to be skilled in understanding and how to be selective in what you recorded, how you recorded it, what was bounced together. And there was a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of technical stuff that went along with the creative. Now, and this is a 20-minute conversation if we want to go off on it. But now if we quickly flip to the modern age. Well, since the invention of the DAW, the D-A-W, the Digital Audio Workstation, things have changed. Now we have unlimited tracks. And not only do we have unlimited tracks, we have the ability to correct things, either tempo, timing, tuning, you name it. We can really, really heavily adjust the performance. Where a producer of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, etc., spent half the 90s, spent their time getting great performances out of artists. And more importantly, identifying when a performance was great, going, that's the one, that's the one I'm going to keep. Now, of course, in the 2000s and beyond, or since the advent of DAWs, you can correct those things. And this is where the argument comes in, doesn't it? This is where everybody gets into a big fight about is it better or worse? I would say it's better and worse. Because if we lean on the tools, we get very sterile sounding music. If we don't lean on the tools and just utilize the tools to fix things that need to be fixed, subtle things, then we get the best of all worlds because we get additional tracks that we can now have. We get the ability to maybe take an amazing performance and just adjust two things that were wrong with it, and we are winning. Once again, the problem with modern production, if there is a problem, you can fight about that, is that the tools, if used, as the sole way of production, the sole method of production creates sterile music because we then start to assume that everything has to be in time, meaning it has to be almost gridded and perfect. And then all the parts that are layered suddenly have to be gridded and perfect to those parts. Then the tuning has to be great. And then every single piece of information has to be mixed so it's flat and perfect and whatever. And we end up with music that tends to sound very, use that word again, sterile, very boring very uneventful, very unimaginative. So I have no problem with modern production. It's just how you use it. The techniques are there. The door, the DAW, allows amazing opportunity to in create incredible things. I mean, think of when we interviewed John Kurlander talking about recording strings for Lord of the Rings all over the world with different orchestras in different 
places and blending it all together to sound like one complete soundtrack. That is something that could only be done in the digital world because he was able to blend things so seamlessly, you know, sample perfect, but absolutely incredible sounding, not sitting there and perfecting everything, but manipulating things so that they were seamless. And that is a blessing of the technology and an advantage of digital technology. But in the wrong hands and used in the wrong way, it can make music really dull. So I think the biggest difference is the availability of the tools and us not using our skills as much and relying on the tools. So the answer to that is exactly that. Don't let your skills come second to relying on the tools. Skills first, tools second. How do you know what to play? So you have a nice guitar riff in E minor. What can you play on the bass guitar? Must you follow the chords? That's so genre specific. All right, I'm gonna grab an acoustic guitar. Let's make up something in E minor. I could do a bluesy. So there's a bluesy riff of an E minor. The bass could literally follow it. Or it could do space. So it could just pulsate, boom, boom. Or it could just go. Could just roll on at the E and let there be a little bit of tension as I do the over the. This is where your creativity comes in. What do you want to do? Do you want it to be a rolling line? Do you want it to follow it exactly? Do you want it to be ultra syncopated? Do you want it to have like stuttery? Do you want to do a line that's completely independent of that? We could do a line where we go. It could be dum 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 dum. That could work. Well. You get where I'm going. It's all about the creativity. The line, if it rolls and revolves around on itself, doesn't necessarily have to be exactly the same notes. It can just be something that creates sometimes some tension because we've got that C sharp. That, that C sharp might kind of create a little bit of a rub, but it's kind of tasty. What I would suggest is a couple of things. You could play a pulsating rhythm over the whole thing. You could then do a rolling and then of course you could play exactly the part you have to be creative you have to find different ways of expressing yourself and if you're stuck go and listen to some great music go and listen to stuff that you admire and get inspired there's a great quote from keith richards about songwriting where he says if he gets stuck he just listens to classic songs he listens to amazing songs that he loves and he gets inspired and then he keeps writing. I also read that Diane Warren would listen to the radio, listen more than she would write. She'd just listen, 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 and then start writing. Now I'm, I'm sure, you know, 40 years later, she doesn't need to do that. But when she was first starting, she would always be listening things for inspiration. Whatever can get those juices flowing. If you're writing a great bass line, listen to some great bass players and songs with great bass lines, and I think you'll get it. Point is, in two minutes, I showed you, you know, five different ways of playing a bass line over a simple riff. It really is creativity. Creativity is king. When you're tracking a scratch guitar voice, do you use a click? If it's a scratch, if I'm going to record to it, I'm um, having the band play to it, I may well use a click. But here's the differentiator, and this is where I think we really need to sort of think about production. Going back to the first question, talk about production. If an artist is playing a song that does ebb and flow, actually speeds up and slows down, we just did a cover of Don't Let Me Down, which is going to come out soon. That has so many tempo changes in it, it's ridiculous. You could not just find a steady click on it. It doesn't have a steady tempo. 
If I was tracking that and all I had was a vocal acoustic, I'd get the guitar player and the singer or just the singer who plays guitar, whatever it might be, to put down a scratch take that felt good to them. And then actually I would create a click track against it. Because if they're performing it with those kind of ebbs and flows, I want to preserve that. I don't want to take something that should actually speed up slightly and slow down, like speed up in the chorus ever so slightly, slow down in the verses. I don't want to take that soul out of it and then it become really, really boring. I remember when I was working with Don Smith about 27 years ago, when we were cutting vocals, the singer was having a really, really hard time singing along with the tracks. So he took an electric guitar and he put tape on the strings so that the strings were just dead. Strap the guitar on the singer. The singer played along with the song. If you listen to the vocal ever so quietly in the background, you can hear a little clink, clink, clink. Nothing to worry about. But what it was is like the singer was grooving with the guitar. There was something about the strumming that made the vocal sit in the pocket. Take that action out of it, and it suddenly became very sterile. So, if you want to create a really, really amazing track that's born from a vocal acoustic, sometimes it's best not to use a click. Sometimes it's best to capture a great vocal performance with the guitarist and see if you can beat it. You know, especially if it's a separate guitar player and a singer, you might be able to have the singer sit in a different environment, have them separated from the guitar player, have them both perform at the same time, do two or three takes, comp it together, and then track to that. And you might find you may never beat that vocal. That rhythm guitar might be magical. Point is, is like always be recording and always when you're recording, make it something that you'd be proud of keeping. So I never just think about scratch or demo because I don't know where it's going to go. If it's a really good performance, that might be all I need. And it might be the first, second or third vocal that the singer did. Is there ever an appropriate time to automate the bass guitar? Yeah, always. In mixes, when it comes up to a chorus, I may want that whole thing to get absolutely massive. So an extra dB of bass guitar might be perfect. But still, I might have some big fat synths coming in, so I might not just automate the volume, I might automate the low end. Maybe the bass guitar needs more bite and more saturation and more distortion in the chorus and a little less low end because these big fat synths came in and now there's too much low end. The point is, is like automation is your friend. And the wonderful, wonderful thing about this modern world where we're talking earlier about old school production versus modern is that we can do these kinds of things. We can say there's a synth bass, but I don't want to lose the bass guitar. So let's just make the bass guitar ratty and bratty and distorted and wipe out the low end just for the choruses and let the sub take over, the sub synth. So automating bass guitar, yeah, you can do it all over the place. You can have more distortion, less distortion, more volume, less volume, more low end, less low end, more mid range, less mid range. You can even put effects on the bass. Who knows? Maybe there's a bass going down, down, and you want down, 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 down. I mean, Pink Floyd, one of these days. I rest my case, delay on a bass. So thanks everyone for the great, great questions. Um, this is fun to do Frequently Asked Questions Fridays. I think we'll do it again next week. Please leave us your questions down below and Eric will scour them for next week's Frequently Asked Questions. Thanks everyone. So long, farewell, au revoir, and au revoir. Adios, goodbye. Tossings. <laughs>